Hi, everybody. Welcome in. We're going to get started in just a moment here. Just waiting for more people to, to file in. Thanks for joining everybody. Yeah, we'll get started in just a moment here. And feel free to introduce yourself in the chat if you'd like, as Jessica said. All right, why don't we get going? Um, thanks everybody again for your time today. Uh, this should be an interesting discussion. Uh, my name is Alex Waltz. I'm a principal planner here at RTA, work in our local planning group. Um, and this is the second in our annual web webinar series that we call Transportation Tuesdays. You can see why we called it that um, for both alliteration um, and yeah, it's on Tuesday. Um, so today's session, we're going to be talking about uh, parking mandates or parking minimums and transit oriented development and specifically how minimum parking requirements impact land use, housing and development from a couple different perspectives. Um, so I want to run through our agenda for the session today. Um, I'm going to start out with a little bit of background on parking mandates and parking minimums, providing a little bit of history and some common critiques of them. Um, I suspect that most people on this call will have some knowledge of parking minimums, but in case anybody doesn't and this is new information, we want to give that to you. We're going to talk a little bit about some parking studies in the Chicago region uh, that we looked at that talk a little bit about how much parking is provided, how much do parking spaces cost to construct, and then the bulk of our time today will be devoted to our panel discussion. We have a great panel of four different experts in this field. We're going to be asking them about the impact of parking mandates on land use, on housing affordability, on mode choice, and getting some municipal approaches to redu reducing or eliminating parking requirements from people who work um, in our region and also uh, in the Midwest more broadly. And last, we'll save a little bit of time for questions from the audience. So I wanted to start off uh, by introducing our panelists. Um, they're listed here in alphabetical order. Uh, first, uh, Juan Sebastian Arias is the executive director, new executive director of Elevated Chicago. So congratulations to Juan Sebastian. Um, Next, we have Lindsay Bailey, who is the program lead for Safe and Complete Streets at uh, CMAP, or the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, which is the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Chicago region. And she also does a little bit of work in the activist space as a co-founder for the Parking Road Reform Network. Next, we have Liz Williams, who is the planning manager in the city of Evanston, although um, she's also worked in other areas in the country. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have Jason Wittenberg, uh, who is the co-development manager for the city of Minneapolis and who um, received uh, his um, plan degree from UIC. So as I said, I wanted to start off just with a little bit of background on parking mandates or also known as parking minimums. Um, and these are regulations that are typically in a municipality's zoning ordinance, and they require new developments or redevelopments to provide off-street and on-street parking spaces. And the number of parking spaces is generally based on the use, so the type of use, whether it's residential or commercial or um, some other type of use, the intensity of that use, so how many people are expected to be in that building, for example, um, or the density of that development and the location, so is it located close to transit or far away from transit. Um, and I did a little bit of digging and what I could find was that it seems like off-street parking lots 
really first became prominent in the 1920s and they were accompanied by some municipal requirements for off-street parking spaces. Uh, but these requirements really proliferated um, in the 1950s and 60s. And that, you know, along with some of the other transportation policy at that time, shaped highway era development. And this image that you see is of downtown Chicago. And the reason why I chose this image is because I think it illustrates, at least to a degree, kind of what parking minimums look like um, in the built form. So this image um, shows Marina City, which people affectionately refer to as the Corn Cob Buildings, just along the Chicago River. And it was constructed between 1960 and 1968, from what I could find. And I wasn't able to necessarily like 100% verify this, but I believe it was um, subject to minimum parking requirements that were included in Chicago's 1957 zoning ordinance. Um, so I think it both visually shows kind of what parking requirements look like, and also as one of maybe one of the earlier buildings in downtown to be subject to these requirements. So after the kind of the proliferation of parking minimums in the 1950s and 60s, they did become a little bit more standardized through the Institute of Transportation Engineers um, Parking Generation Manual, which was first published in 1985. And so the most recent edition um, is the sixth edition. So they've updated it you know, periodically over time. And this parking generation manual is what a lot of municipalities use to come up with how many parking spaces new developments must provide. And these requirements are based on for example, the number of residential units or the square footage of commercial space of its commercial use um, for a school or an institutional building. Um, the requirements might be based on the number of employees or staff or students uh, or for things like recreational uses. For example, a pool, might, it, the number of spaces might be uh, based on the size of that pool or for a bowling alley, like the number of bowling out, the number of specific alleys within that uh, bowling facility. So minimum parking requirements have also been subject to a variety of different critiques, um, specifically the generation rates that are proposed in the parking generation manual have become, have been criticized uh, by planners in the field. And some of these critiques are that these parking generation rates are based on a, a relatively small sample of studies that were uh, performed in suburban locations that have limited or no transit service. And so the result of this is that um, because the studies were, observed, were performed in suburban contexts where people are driving mostly, um, the critique is that these generation rates tend to oversupply parking. Um, Another critique is that these calculations of parking generation rates assume that parking is free, but we know that parking, the cost of parking does influence people's uh, use of that facility. Also, another critique is that parking generation rates are typically based on observed occupancy at peak demand times, but we interpret them as required minimums. So the minimum amount of parking that we're providing um, is really matched up with the most amount of demand for parking that we could provide. So this image is of a suburb in the Chicago region called um, Schaumburg. And it's this activity node has one bus route um, that's running north-south along this arterial here. Um, and it's, you know, in general, I think a typical result of using ITE parking generation rates to set minimums for new developments. So we grabbed a couple of different studies in the Chicago region to dig into this a little bit more. Um, this image is actually in Cincinnati, but um, I think it's a neat image. So in, in terms of the cost of parking, um, this, back in 2016, the cost of constructing a parking space in a surface lot in the Chicago region was uh, about $4,200 and over $37,000 for an indoor underground garage. Um, if you were to convert those to today's dollars, um, a surface parking space would cost a little bit more, like approaching uh, 5,500. Um, an indoor underground garage space would cost 
um, closer to 49,000. But some other uh, buildings elsewhere, um, including in Minneapolis, Jason has um, worked for the city of Ma Minneapolis. Some of garage, some garage spaces in Minneapolis can cost as much as 60,000 per space. So underground garage spaces typically, you know, cost a lot more, but overall parking is, you know, quite costly. Some of the studies that we found uh, in the Chicago region estimated the amount, or not estimated, but calculated the amount of parking spaces that are um, provided for multifamily units, but and also looked at how many of those spaces are used during an overnight period. So of a survey of 41 different multifamily residential buildings in the Chicago region that all had more than 10 apartments, typically provided just over you know, 0.6 spaces per unit, but the number of spaces that were used was just over half of that. So this study revealed that for most, you know, for this survey of rental buildings that have more than 10 apartments, parking was oversupplied. And um, for buildings that had a greater mix of two and three bedroom units versus one bedroom and studio units, those two and three bedroom buildings generally generally provided more spaces per unit and also um, the the usage was a little bit less in terms of the percent of parking supplied. When you look at proximity to transit stations and usage of parking, um, some of these studies showed that within a half mile of a CTA rail station, buildings would provide about half a space per unit in the building, but occupied units used only about um, a third of a space per unit, per unit. So of all of the spaces that are provided, maybe about 62% of them are used overnight. Um, this is similar to looking at usage of parking in proximity to bus or rail transit. Um, generally, you know, those buildings provided a similar amount of spaces um, and they, the occupied units used a little bit less of those spaces. In terms of how people change their um, travel patterns and when moving to a new development that's close to transit, we found that, um, yeah, almost a quarter of residents who moved to transit-oriented developments reduced their vehicle ownership. So allowing more people to live in transit-oriented developments um, encourages people to reduce their uh, usage of vehicles. This is from, this table is from a 2017 um, report from Evanston, which the city used to develop its um, parking requirements, which um, Liz will talk about a little bit later. Um, and this table is showing the number of parking spaces that a couple different multifamily developments in Evanston provided, and also how many of those spaces were being used. So generally for each of these developments, um, there was more than one space per unit provided. Um, but the number of spaces that were used is closer to one. So this table is showing that for these multifamily developments in Evanston, um, parking was oversupplied uh, in comparison to how much it was used. So now I wanted to yeah, jump into kind of the bulk of, of our discussion today, which is gonna be a panel discussion. And first um, I wanted to talk about uh, how parking mandates and parking minimums influence land use. So opening this question up to all of our four different panelists, wondering how do parking mandates influence land use? I can go ahead and start. So yeah. dedicating large portions of, of land to a relatively inactive use like parking sort of reduces the efficiency of the, of the use of land and it makes it more difficult for residents to kind of serve their daily uh, needs within a relatively small geographic footprint. It's, it spreads out those, those land uses farther from one another typically. 
and as much as a community might attempt to implement more walkable urban design practices, those practices are made a bit less effective when properties are required to accommodate parking and their drive aisles and, and, and curb cuts um, for, for automobiles. Um, I want to add on what Jason's saying with, you know, and Jason's talking about sort of the bigger impact on the community, but even from a site level, uh, sort of viewpoint, you'll often hear that architects will say that when they're building a big project, they start with the parking. So their project, the design is going to be influenced by how much parking is required. And then they figure out how much they can fit and if it's worth building. So you might not get a project because the parking requirements will make it so that your project doesn't pencil out. So you're automatically losing out on some of that tax revenue. In other cases, it would limit the number of units you can build because you're trying to keep that parking down to keep your costs down. So you get fewer units. And then that makes it so you need to make your money back on what you're building. So you have to make those units more expensive to cover your costs. So you lose out on potential more affordable units. And you lose out on the number of different uses that could be on the site. And like I said, sometimes you lose out on any development at all. Yeah, I think Jason and uh, Lindsay really summed it up. I think, you know, parking mandates really prioritize cars over people, you know, at the end of the day. Um, parking requirements generally take up just as much square footage as the dwellings on sites. And, you know, again, um, imagine a world where we are prioritizing people and the efficient use of space um, and creating places for people to call home um, or businesses to flourish. I think that, you know, from my standpoint, it really is putting cars before people. And I think that is somewhat backwards in a lot of ways. Yeah, and I, I don't feel like there's a lot more to really add to what Jason, Lindsay and Liz have covered so well already, but maybe just to say it in a slightly different way that, um, as Liz was just emphasizing, right, that how parking mandates prioritize cars over people, the net effect at like a neighborhood scale or the community scale is is less walkable, is less people friendly, right? And that is just, you know, I, I, and I want to share that as like an example of how um, it's felt or parking mandates then influence the feel of the built environment neighborhoods um, all over the city, right? And um, at Elevate Chicago, we're particularly focused on equitable transit oriented development. So there's, I think an even bigger, or there's another layer on this when you do have um, parking mandates, um, overly rigid um, parking mandates right next to transit. It's also, there's just a, there's an, an inherent disconnect there between some of the larger goals that we have on a sustainability scale, on a neighborhood walkability scale. Um, and that is one of the net, the net effects of how this shows up. Yeah, thanks for everybody. I want to show, I want to share um, an image, two images quickly, um, kind of illustrate a little bit about what Juan Sebastian was just saying. Oh, um, Alex? So, yes. What we've got is your presentation view rather than. Oh, really? Slides. Oh, okay. Thanks, Lindsay. Let's Is that better? We see the sidebar. Um, it looks like it's on the. Yeah, so maybe if you okay. try to start the slideshow now. There we go. So this image is of um, Barrington, Illinois. And this ex kind of exemplifies a little bit about what Juan Sebastian was just saying. So. This is image is from uh, one of Lindsay's president presentations. So thanks, Lindsay, for providing this. And this shows in pink all of the service parking lots um, or all of the parking lots that are in this suburb. And you can see that the parking tends to increase the distances between destinations, which decreases the walkability of this area.
I'm having trouble um, stopping. Oh, okay, there we go. All right. Um, I did. I wanted to pick up on um, something that Lindsay had said in terms of developers and their response to parking requirements. In your experience and your conversations with them, how do developers think about parking mandates and how do parking mandates impact their developments? I can get started a little bit. So, yeah. you know, in my experience, and I'm not a developer, but I've interacted and worked with um, several or many over over the years. In my experience, um, developers seek flexibility, right? And so, um, having um, some some mandates are, you know, I think they they may comply as they have to. And I think Lindsay gave a really good example of how the design often will start with the parking mandates. Um, but in my in my experience, um, developers like flexibility, and so my mandates do not provide that. Right? Um, they provide some maybe clarity or some some expectation, um, but they do not provide they do not provide flexibility. And then that does also have rippling effects for the financial feasibility of certain developments of what what can pencil out the number of units that you can build if it's a residential, um, and so those all become compounding. Um, uh, effects that that limit investment or that make new development harder to pencil out to. And I think it's worth noting that when a city eliminates minimum parking requirements, that doesn't necessarily mean that developers aren't going to provide parking, right? We've uh, certainly seen uh, in Minneapolis since we eliminated all parking minimums in 2021, we've seen some uh, new developments with that provide no parking and uh, We've definitely seen a de decrease in the average amount of parking provided per unit, uh, but developers also have their lenders and investors to work with, and, and they have to be also satisfied that it's going to be a marketable project that people are going to want to want to choose. And parking is one calculation that, that they have to make in deciding whether they're going to have a uh, a, a project that's that's feasible for people and uh, appeals to people. Yeah, I would agree. I think both of them hit it on the head. Um, most projects that I review, our team reviews through the city of Evanston are coming along with requests for variations from our parking minimums. And um, most of the time developers are telling us that their market studies are just not showing that there's the demand of parking aligning with the requirements in the jurisdictions. And so it just takes more time and money and um, energy for everybody involved um, to have to review those requests for variations um, and, you know, ultimately drives up the cost of doing business um, in a lot of ways. And um, so, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I think both have kind of hit on this point pretty well. I, yeah, don't have a lot to add, but I have had, I'm, I was, I found it very interesting to learn that you'll see a lot of apartment buildings like in the downtown area where they also have public parking. And that's because the amount of spaces they were required to provide are way more than what is actually being used. So the developer had to go back to the city and say, I need a permit to make this public parking because they're sitting unused and I want to be able to make money from my parking. So I think that's just adding evidence to the requirements that had been in place were higher than what was actually needed. And it's because we don't really know and we're not giving the market a chance to adapt to what is demanding. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, uh, Robert, I see your hand is raised. If you could um, hold your question until the end uh, during our Q&A session, um, that would be great. I wanted to dive in a little bit about um, affordability and equity. Um, I think we've alluded to this a little bit in our responses so far, but I wanted to ask more specifically, um, how do parking mandates influence affordability of housing? I think Lindsay had mentioned a little bit about this um, earlier. 
Um, is this the like broader equity question or are we just talking affordability? Because I'm just affordability. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I just talked about the what they're able to build because you have to be able to have your project pencil out and as you mentioned the cost of parking which you know we've seen in some cases much higher than you know thirty forty thousand dollars per space you know add that into your cost of your unit and if you didn't have to provide that parking or if you even had the parking and had people pay for it separately which is called unbundled parking you'll see a lot fewer people using the spaces and then it makes it so that the unit's more affordable to the tenant living there but really i feel like others can add more too i'll, I'll add just one more i i agree and i think that was um well put and i'll add one more or a different layer to this um and this was an argument that we um or a fact that we that we we try to make clear um, during the recent passage of some related legislation in Chicago, um, which I know we'll talk about in a bit too. But um, um, when you think about the city, you know, or public funds that go to subsidize affordable housing development, parking mandates um, limit the impact of that. Mm -hmm. And so what I mean, what I mean by that is that um, parking mandates make so that some of that subsidy, that limited um, subsidy that municipalities have, ends up having to pay for, for parking spots. Um, the example that we would talk about, um, that we would use as we were making the case for that legislation, um, focused on this one example of an equitable transit-oriented development project, 43, 43 Green, in the Bronzeville um, neighborhood of Chicago. 99 units, half market rate, half affordable, about, and 24 parking spaces. If there were no, and it was right next to a Green Line station, so it qualified for um, some of the parking flexibility um, that existed at the time. Um, and if there was no parking flexibility, if there were, if that development had to comply with the regular parking mandates that, that, that otherwise exist, it would have cost $2.2 .2 million more to add, to build that parking. Um, and so that's just one example, right, of parking mandates requiring more investment to get um, limited uh, investment from limited funds to provide affordable housing as well. Um, so just to share that anecdote as well. I'll add that in Minneapolis, a key part of achieving our equity goals involves creating opportunities for more housing options in places where housing variety hasn't really been allowed for decades. And it's probably been the elimination of parking mandates that has had the greatest impact on the ability to expand housing choices in places where those choices hadn't been present before. And I think later in the presentation, I have an example of that. Yeah, thanks. I wanted to pick up on that thread. In terms of the types of housing that is built, how do parking requirements influence what buildings are built and the design of them and the site layout. I think I have a, um, one of the things that we yeah, talk about, I guess, frequently in the, the housing space is this idea of um, missing middle housing. So I'm just going to share an image. Um, and this is, you know, a pretty well-known image showing what um, one designer had termed the missing middle housing. So in between kind of your most high density um, housing products and your detached single family homes is this whole menu of different housing options that um, are a little bit higher density than single family homes, but not quite as high density as um, high rises. And so to, one of the things that we've noticed is that parking requirements tend to eliminate these missing metal housing options um, in construction. And yeah. um, Jason, I think, oh yeah, go ahead. 
No, I was just going to say, I, I would agree here in Evanston, you know, the bulk of the projects we've been seeing are multifamily developments. Um, a lot of the housing units are a lot smaller. They don't necessarily um, fit the the style um, of what we're hearing from community members that they're seeking. Um, and I think from that standpoint, um, it, it's just kind of exacerbating the supply and lack of diversity of housing uh, here in Evanston, particularly. And like along those lines of what Liz is saying is you end up with fewer like options for families because if you, you know, wanted a three bedroom place and you have to have your number of parking spaces per bedroom you, you can't have your like young kids in their rooms and they don't need a car like they can't drive so they don't need a parking spot and so typically what ends up being built is going to be more for single young people and the, the the housing for families gets the short end of the stick. Thanks. And yeah, I just responding to Adam's um, question in the chat, the the bungalow court housing style I think is more um, it's smaller apartments that are kind of arranged around a central courtyard. And I wanted to share one other image. Um, and Jason, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about uh, what this building is. Um, yeah, this, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, this is a 12 unit development in South Minneapolis, a newer development constructed within the past couple of years. Um, our, our comprehensive plan and our zoning reform have created quite a bit of land that's now available for the scale of, of missing middle housing. And this particular project was developed with no automobile parking. And, and that probably contributes to there being it having more reasonable rents than than uh, an equivalent new project of its quality of uh, studio will start at less than thirteen hundred dollars a month, which again, not extremely affordable, but for new construction of this quality and its location, a lot of uh, near really high quality transits uh, on a really great bike infrastructure uh, near some natural amenities right across the street from a park. Um, it's it's really a, a reasonably affordable uh, new development. And then the project couldn't have been accomplished on a property like this uh, that's just under 6,000 square feet had had parking been required you had, you know, a rate of one space per unit or even a half space per unit that the geometry simply wouldn't work for that. Uh, and certainly some people who live in the building undoubtedly have cars, right? But this is a great housing option for people who prioritize having all of those other opportunities over having a, a spot off street to, to store their vehicle. Thanks, Jason. I wanted to um, dive into kind of a more broader equity conversation. Um, so in terms of some more general like equity concerns, um, how would you describe those in relation or how would you describe the equity concerns related to requiring uh, parking spaces for new developments? Okay, this is a topic that I'm always really interested in hearing about and opening up to other people uh, because I think the main goal of, you know, in at least from the parking reform network standpoint of getting parking right and getting rid of parking mandates is to reduce car dependency. And there are so many people for whom driving is not an option. There's a disability rights advocate, Anna Zivarts, who has a book by a name similar to that. But whether that is because of their age, a disability, a temporary condition, or financial reasons that you just can't afford a car. And there are so many things that we need to address to make our city fully accessible and getting rid of mandates is that first step. But I mean, I'd also love to hear just as much enthusiasm 
for making sure all of our sidewalks are accessible as there are for creating accessible car parking spaces. Because reducing that car dependency and having things close together where you don't need a car to get around is really going to be the primary benefit of having a walkable environment, being in a city. And by having parking mandates, you put a barrier up to that proximity of your uses and goods, and you're spreading things out. And then it makes it less friendly to get around without a car. Um, and reducing that car dependency also increases financial freedom. And oftentimes people with disabilities are income restricted. Many of them can't afford to have an accessible vehicle because those are really pricey. And so really we're talking about creating a city where it's friendly for everybody to get around. And that's that's just one aspect of the equity issue. Yeah, I, I um, uh, completely agree. I want to just echo what Lindsay was saying, right? And I appreciate, um, Alex, you making equity explicitly into the conversation as well. It's also, um, as I mentioned earlier, Elevated Chicago is focused on equitable transit-oriented development with that um, very front of mind or laser focused. And the way that we, in the way that I think about equity um, um, gets... Um, thinks about also, or we think about also like the upstream effects, right? Like how this all comes together to impact the, the very, the, the real lived experience of residents in Chicago. And as Lindsay was saying, we know that more walkable communities, more um, uh, uh, more affordable housing near transit, a, a broader diversity of housing options so that more different kinds of households and family types are able to live near transit. Um, all of that amounts to benefits for sustainability, for um, public health, and all of those contribute to uh, equity outcomes. Um, I would note that, you know, for, for us, park, parking flexibility is one part of a suite of investments and policies that are needed in order to really make equity, um, to, to advance racial and social equity in the city too. So, I think it's important to consider providing um, parking flexibility matched with other incentives or requirements for affordable housing, matched with other investments in community-driven projects and more funding for um, uh, uh, small businesses or affordable housing developments and things like that. So I do, I do also want to keep that larger perspective in mind. Um, I do think ultimately what we're talking about here with parking mandates in particular is how to provide more flexibility and how to um, even, you know, um, make it even easier for some of these projects to pencil out. Um, one of the lenses that we that we have, or one of the, 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 the issues that we're often focused on at Elevated Chicago is also on um, encouraging or facilitating investment in disinvested parts of the city, um, where there is not much private investment that's happening. And parking flexibility is in support of that, um, of course, you also need other investment and more um, public funding to go into into place too. Leveraging of uh, vac uh, publicly owned vacant lots as part of an overall strategy too. So I probably jumped around a bit. I would say that there's like a very big connection to equity outcomes in this, you know, parking mandates conversation, and it's important to also think about um, the other pieces, the other parts of the system as well. Can I add one other thing? I feel like a lot of times the equity issue is something that is weaponized on both sides of the like we should keep them, we should get rid of them debate. And I think the most important factor is working with the disability community and listening to their concerns and hearing what are the most important things and how we can make the city more accessible. And that will be more valuable than the sound bites that that I can provide. Thanks. Anything else to add up from the other panelists? Okay. Just Lindsay Bailey for president. That was really well said. <laughs> Thanks. I wanted to, yeah, um, we're getting a lot of good questions in the chat, so um, I do want to make sure that we get to those, um, but I wanted to, yeah, 
make sure that we talk about some of the other topics that we have um, on the agenda. In terms of mode choice, like how people choose how they're going to travel, how do parking requirements influence that decision-making process? Um, I think, well, yeah, yeah I, think, ahead, I think, um, you know, from, from my perspective, it, it just simply exacerbates the car dependency, um, kind of issue that we have to wrestle with and grapple with, um, as communities. And, um, I think it's, you know, just a disincentive to, um, alternative modes of transportation and, um, you know, I think it also induces demand um, for parking because it's in car ownership and just using it. Um, and um, so those are just a few quick top of mind things that I would offer. I also like to acknowledge that like having the parking is like what Liz just said. That's inviting a car to come to the neighborhood. So I think a lot of times people think that the parking will help reduce traffic and it also potentially has the ability to increase traffic that you're, you're bringing a car here. And, and I know for myself personally, that if I had had a parking space when I lived in DC, I might've kept my car and I might've driven a lot more, but like I kept getting parking tickets. And so I had to sell it, get rid of it and switch to a bike. And I think that, if it were easier to park, I'd still be driving. That was, you know, 20 some years ago. So they, they can influence it, positive, negative, but really it is when you make it, when you add all that parking in it, and spreading things out, it becomes less friendly to get around on a bike or walking. You have all the driveways, curb cuts, and more traffic. So that's a big influence. Thanks, everyone. I wanted to um, talk now about kind of a couple different municipal approaches to um, to parking requirements. Um, talking about Chicago and Evanston and Minneapolis. Um, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time just reviewing the city's most recent um, connected communities ordinance which was adopted in 2022 and was the result of um, the image you see on the right, which was an ETOD policy plan. And what the and the, that policy plan was um, adopted in 2021. And the Connected Communities Ordinance applies to um, parcels that are close to CTA and Metro rail stations and also high frequency bus routes, as well as a set of zoning districts that are generally located a little bit more high density portions of uh, the city. And what this ordinance allows is a reduction in parking by right of 50%. So developers would uh, be allowed to provide immediately without any other approvals, um, half as much parking as they're required currently, or as they require, as they were required prior to the ordinance. Um, but this reduction is also um, has the potential to be up to 100% um, by an administrative adjustment. Um, and one Sebastian's organization was um, heavily involved in the development of this policy plan and the ordinance. And so I was wondering, um, and the other panelists, feel free to jump in if you are aware of any kind of critiques, but I'm wondering what were some common critiques of this Connected Communities Ordinance and how did planners respond to them? Yeah, very happy to talk about this for a bit. Um, and so first I'll start with this a little bit of context too, in that Chicago's had a TOD policy um, since I believe it was 2013 that's, that provided, that started to provide some parking flexibility um, at, uh, at a very close proximity to transit. I forget how much, I think it was like half a block maybe. Um, it's been updated uh, since then several times. And increasingly, um, the 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 distance from transit 
or the types of transit that the parking flexibility is applied to nearby is applied applied nearby has expanded. And so what we accomplished under the connected communities ordinance and I was um, working in the mayor's office at this time too, so I can speak to it also from that perspective, um, was just a, a more, a much, much more dramatic geographic expansion of, of, where, we, of where the city zoning code allows for uh, the, the, the parking flexibility that you just noted too. Um, so the big changes were going from a quarter mile to a, with some exceptions, to a standard half mile radius. So it's about a 10 minute walk. Um, and then also extending from um, uh, um, applying that flexibility to uh, a lot more bus corridors and bus routes throughout the city. I believe before it was just maybe 10 and this included, you know, and with this expansion under connected, under connected communities, it's, you know, it's hard to find uh, some corridors in the city that are that do not have some parking flexibility now. I'll say that um, for the overall ordinance, it was a package of different reforms, um, at least a dozen. This was just one piece of it. And I think, um, yeah, I think one one benefit of having a larger package was that there was not as much critiques around this parking flexibility piece. There was actually also a provision um, within the, the, the ordinance that was passed that did, that did put in place a parking cap in some instances too, which is an even more um, aggressive version of some of this conversation too. Um, but generally there was not, as, and, and I found this a little bit surprising to even going through the process um, myself, is that there was not a lot of um, strong concerns that were raised over the extension of this parking flexibility to um, a broader geography. Maybe part of that is because it had existed, you know, it's been in existence for a while in Chicago. Um, there were some questions about why going up to half a mile. Um, so maybe some light concerns, but um, nothing that ultimately posed any real um, blockage or caused anything to be negotiated out of the final ordinance. Um, there were other things that 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 did get a lot more um, attention and that um, got a lot more um, pushback that even were not included in the end ordinance too. So I think even from maybe just like a strategic legislative or political perspective, um, it was helpful to have a larger package that also had um, that had other other items, you know, related to these overall ETOD goals. All that to say is that, you know, I think I mentioned this earlier, we really focused on the benefit to city to, to expanding the impact of city investments. As, as a key argument to help um, convince city council mem members to on why it's important to be able to have some more flexible flexibility in parking for affordable housing developments. Not a big difference if it's two blocks from transit or two and a half blocks from transit. And so why not just provide that flexibility now? I just wanna say that I think that the ETOD ordinance does in the, in the longer version, if people read the full text of all the documentation that were produced, that they lay out the case for why they needed to take it further, that even though we had TOD flexibility in place, 90% of new developments were occurring in the wealthier white neighborhoods. And so what were ways that we could help bring some of these benefits to other areas around the city? I think that that ordinance really helped address that. Thanks. I want to talk a little bit yeah, now about um, some other municipal approaches to um, reducing or eliminating parking requirements. So uh, two of our panelists are from Evanston and Minneapolis, respectively. In 2017, Evanston reduced their off-street parking requirements for transit-oriented developments. I mean, you can see in the table on the right hand of the screen what that change was. Um, and in Minneapolis, uh, the city completely eliminated off-street parking requirements for all developments in 2021. Um, and there is a state bill that's currently working. It's where I think it's yeah, it's been introduced to the legislation um, to eliminate off-street parking requirements throughout the state. Um, but that's still, yeah, kind of in the, it hasn't been passed yet. Um, so I'm wondering in Evanston and Minneapolis, how did 
residents respond to proposals of reducing parking requirements? What were some common concerns that you heard and what counter arguments to skeptics were most effective or convincing? Jason, do you want me to jump in first? Sure. Okay. Um, I think a lot of the concerns that we heard here in Evanston and the 2017 update actually predated my time here, but um, we have recently had attempts since I started to actually update and reform our TOD parking even further. And I think some of the common concerns that we hear are really just the impact on um, the business community, on residential neighborhoods, you know, residents in areas with um, you know, limited transportation options also kind of spoke to concerns that um, it would have on, on parking near homes. Um, there was also a lot of conversation around potential increases in illegal parking. So with the uptick in, you know, delivery services, um, a lot of double parking and concerned that the on-street availability is not there anymore. So it's just exacerbating traffic congestion um, with folks not parking um, correctly. Um, commonly, we hear impacts on property values as being one of the concerns of neighborhood residents. Um, and um, just the lack of alternative options as well and access to those options. Um, so those were a lot of the, the concerns that were heard. Um, we, we definitely tried to counter those concerns with um, arguments around how parking mandates do increase traffic congestion. Again, that um, induced demand by having it there. Um, we, you know, frequently refer back to our climate action and resiliency plan and how that is a really important foundational perspective. We want to promote sustainable transportation um, modes. And if we continue the status quo, you know, we're, we're never going to see changes that happen. Um, we also talk a lot about the efficient use of space. A lot of, you know, what we've already hit on here as a panel um, cost savings um, is a big piece and um, just improved urban design in general. Um, we have found that since these um, changes have gone in here in Evanston, that we are still receiving requests from developers to vary even the TOD standards that were reduced. Um, and one of the tools that we've deployed um, in areas where there are concerns from developers that they're still over parking their sites um, is to allow for flexibility in offsite parking lease arrangements that after a year or two, we can go back and revisit administratively. And that's one tool that I think has been really successful in kind of combating the neighborhood concerns that we're hearing. Um, because developers are finding um, open available surface parking or structure parking in the neighborhood and they're leasing those spaces um, kind of in the interim to see what demand is occurring. And we've had several examples where through that kind of collection of demand um, that we've released the requirement for them to lease that offsite parking within a certain distance of their development because the demand and it's just not there. Um, so that's just one way that we've tried to support um, development and kind of the market-based approach and flexibility to uh, parking. And um, there's still a lot more work to do. Um, our team just recently received a referral from our electeds to look at setting um, parking maximums instead of minimums that we currently have. So that is uh, in the works and are definitely working uh, with a, a group of community members to talk about the pros and cons and going in that direction. So at the city of Minneapolis, we've been kind of incrementally working on parking reform for about 25 years. So. One reason that our elimination of parking mandates four years ago wasn't particularly controversial is that it was kind of an incremental change for us. The downtown area hadn't had parking requirements for a very long time. And 
the city's transit rich areas had parking requiring requirements largely largely eliminated for residential development in 2015 and people saw that the sky hadn't fallen so this was sort of the next incremental step for us our our comprehensive plan minneapolis 2040 had a very clear policy statement that the city was going to eliminate parking mandates and there was relatively little pushback to both the policy and the, the implementation and admittedly part of that might have been that um, we became the first city to eliminate exclusive single family zoning and that was sort of the shiny object that a lot of people were really focused on and they, they may have overlooked the elimination of parking minimums in the process uh, we we did hear some concerns uh, from uh, disability advocacy organizations about parking uh, elimination of parking mandates and uh, one provision that was added as a result of that is that if you do have alley access you're essentially uh, required to provide a, a drop-off space that with an accessible route to the building if indeed you're you're not providing any parking uh, for the for the property uh, developers uh, again typically are providing some parking for larger projects that it, it's the average these days is around 0.6 per unit citywide or if you will about six spaces for every 10 units on smaller projects uh, where the, again, the geometry doesn't work out to often provide parking or as much parking. It's more like four spaces for every 10 units. Uh, we are seeing some zero parking developments, as I mentioned, but outside of downtown, those typically haven't been larger than around 20 to 30 units. Um, but it, it's happening. I, and I'd say a little bit more than, than we expected. And uh, I'm not going to pretend that Neighbors are always thrilled about a 20 unit zero parking development going in next to them. Uh, but so far there's been no political will to, to revisit that. Thanks. Yeah, is there anything else um, the panel would like to add in terms of since these changes were implemented, what other changes have you seen in maybe the design of buildings or the pace of new develop of new build new developments being approved. Um, yeah, what changes have you seen um, in that respect? This doesn't really go to what you just asked, but I did want to add one thing about you know the first new zero parking building in Chicago to come to the I think it was the Division Blue Line stop. You know they had a lot of concerned neighbors that didn't want all these people bringing their cars and parking on the street so you know it was just a pilot so they did a residential permit on the block next to the building and they said that people who live in that building can't get that permit so they were just sort of appealing to the residents whether or not that's the best decision or way to go about it it was one way to help reduce those concerns which is something you can revisit later on but i did also want to provide a link to the parking reform networks uh mandates map so this is uh it was a partnership done with strong towns to identify cities across the i guess north america we got some in mexico and canada but um it is where communities have implemented parking reform and it it loads up with cities that have just eliminated them citywide broad strokes but you can also change those filters and get more information of specifically about the policy and what was uh, approved. So in Minneapolis, we've seen a, a tremendous amount of housing construction in recent years. Certainly uh, population uh, has been growing faster than it has uh, during any of our lifetimes. And that has been, that has followed a period of time when we had extremely low vacancy rates for an extended period of time and that was putting a lot of pressure on rents uh, and uh, we've thrown a lot of different how, uh, land use reforms uh, at the wall to see what would work what would stick and uh, and minimum parking requirement requirement reform has been a, a key part of that but certainly not the only part it should be ideally a part of a larger 
strategy uh, if, if your city's goal is to get housing variety and, and a lot of housing production. I'll add just a couple more notes too. One is that, um, well, I think the the it, it's the connected communities ordinance was passed just two just under two years ago, and so um, there have been other um, factors influencing the real estate market cycles too, right? Including interest rates, and so I, I I feel like it might be too early to tell exactly what all the impacts will be, but I'll I will share that um, one thing that was a little surprising to me and. Um, has been some of the benefits for rehab projects, uh, um, rehabilitation projects, not just new developments, and how the, the parking flexibility has enabled a lot more of those to occur across the city. Um, one other thought that I just had that's related to this whole conversation is also that one other, there was one other provision within the final ordinance that was passed that um, um, authorize the Department of Transportation to develop travel demand management rules, which Justin, and I know that the Department of Transportation has issued some guidelines as a first step. And anyway, I know that there has been, uh, that there was some um, early interest from developers in using that resource or, comp or complying with those guidelines because it also gave them a way to point to residents to say, hey, here are, here are, here's, what else we're doing to make up for the fact that there is less parking in this building. And that I think has, uh, that also was surprising to me to hear um, early on that there were some developers looking to comply with that um, guideline without without needing to even, um, because they saw that there was some, I think a narrative benefit or a case-making benefit that they could have from, um, from explaining how they're accounting for um, uh, the less, you know, having fewer parking spaces within the development too. Uh, the last thing I'll, I'll just note is that I think, you know, I think this has already been mentioned a couple times, just resident reactions to the new development that is proposed with less parking. And I think that is another, you know, that is another frontier, another area of work that's needed is in shifting the narrative in um, uh, uh, busting or de uh, yeah, demystifying um what it means to have or to, to have a less parking. Um, and that's something that Elevate Chicago I know is, is interested in and something that I think um, anyone who's interested in this topic should also think about is how can we collectively help, you know, shift the narrative and, and do some public education around, around this. Thanks everyone. Yeah, we, we've got a, a lot of um, questions in the chat and from the audience, so I wanted to uh, make sure that we had the opportunity to talk about those. Um, Jessica, are there any questions that kind of came in early on? Um, yeah, yeah, let me run through them in order. So back when you were talking about the cost of constructing parking spaces, somebody asked, is there an average annual maintenance cost and replacement time period for parking in the region that you are aware of? I don't know. I don't know of any. I used to have these numbers and I do not remember them offhand. Um, yeah. But that's a good point that it's not just the initial cost that you need to consider either. It's maintenance and replacement. Um, I'll also just quickly note that there's an ongoing energy use component to, to, to underground parking where they have to be mechanically ventilated and that does take a significant amount of energy. Another question we got, um, will the panelists be touching on how using land for more housing and retail increases tax revenue for localities as opposed to using that space for parking? You know, we didn't cover that, but I think it's an excellent point that uh, there are organizations out there doing excellent work to show the fiscal impacts of different land use patterns. And they typically come back with showing the benefits of kind of fine grained urbanism where you're not dedicating large parts of your city to, to surface parking. Uh, there's an organization called Urban Three that, uh, in particular, is doing really good work around that. Uh, 
Um, another question, in Chicagoland, where are parking mandates typically coming from? Is it state level, city level, something else? Yeah, I think typically they're coming from the local level. Um, usually parking requirements are a component of the zoning ordinance, um, which is, yeah, at a local level. Alex um, mentioned a Minnesota uh, bill at the legislature that would have prevented Minnesota cities from instituting parking mandates. The legislative session has ended for the for the year and that uh, bill did die. We as a city, you know, tend to um, advocate for local control of such things. So we were a little conflicted as a city that had already done that work um, and, and think it's important, but also um, not really sure that that's the right approach for cities to take uh, in such a, a blanket manner. I, I would suggest maybe if a state legislature is going to do that, it start with uh, transit rich areas where there's a, a large investment in uh, a public investment um, that is at stake when you're talking about um, parking uh, affecting that public investment. Uh, but we'll see if uh, something comes back next year. Um, when you were discussing how developers feel about parking mandates um, and how parking mandates impact developments, um, we had a question, how do you place the burden of developing the best parking requirements for the neighborhood, not solely the best parking requirements for the developer? I don't think anybody knows what that is. I mean, is it you want people or you want cars? How many cars do you want? And then you figure out what's right for your neighbor. Yeah, I, I, I agree, right? I think the question was specifically about the best requirement, which I would maybe even encourage to just think about what is, what is the right number, what, what's the right parking for that development in itself, right? I think we've been talking about providing more flexibility and moving away from hard requirements. Um, and then some of those decisions, I think, can be better hashed out or made within at the individual project level. Um, there was a question, do developers not see a profit in that missing middle housing? And there was a little bit of back and forth in the chat, but if any panelists have more to add about um, how the math works or does not on missing middle. I think, oh, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, I had responded very briefly in the chat that one thing we've heard from developers who do that scale of development is that completing a 20 unit building is about as difficult as completing a 150 unit building, but the financial payoff is typically less at the end. So that's one reason that uh, developers who have capacity to do larger projects often don't uh, spend their time on those, that, that missing middle scale. It, it, it takes a certain kind of you know scrappy developer, it seems like, who, who enjoys uh, trying to make that kind of project work. That is the perfect way to, to put, you know, how, how those projects um, actually come to fruition. We had one recently here in Evanston um, that was a court, you know, courtyard style, bungalow court um, style development. And um, in many cases, the zoning regulations in municipalities prohibit the missing middle type housing. And so from a process standpoint, you can't even propose it from the gate. And then and also from just the economics of how things work, um, it, it it just doesn't always pencil out. Um, so it is it has been um, a challenge that one was successfully passed. And um, we will see some efficiency home development here in Evanston. Um, but it, it is it is a struggle, I would say, on all fronts to, to make it work. I spoke with someone who developed and owns a 16 unit residential building, and they noted to me that if they have two vacancies, they they lose money during that month of two two vacancies. Um, following up on that, uh, do you think eliminating parking or changing building codes to only require one staircase would result in more and cheaper missing middle housing? 
Yeah, there is a move in some states to allow that in state building codes. I, uh, I know Seattle is the only community that I know of right now that has their own kind of building code with a single stair above, a, I, be, I believe it's above three stories. Uh, many communities, you have to provide two means of stairway egress when you get above three stories, I believe it is. Um, it's a, it's, seems as though it's been quite successful at at facilitating that type of missing middle housing in Seattle. And they have a number of um, standards that they have to meet to ensure fire safety. It's not just eliminate one of the stairways and, and be done with it. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert on it, but it, it certainly seems like uh, something that is worth uh, state legislatures taking a, a look at across the country. Um, to reducing car dependency, does increasing and improving public transportation follow that or precede it? How do you work to convince car leaning people that public transportation is a viable option to both invest in and use? So I think that um, Jason alluded to this before, but we get rid of parking mandates. That doesn't mean that people stop building the parking and especially in car dependent places they will continue to build the parking. So I think this is the first step and then the other impacts follow it. I think it, it's gonna take you a lot more time to get a high frequency bus service in your community. So I think it would definitely come before. Let alone a new train line. Um. This question, noting that developers don't always negotiate in the best interest of the development and the neighborhood, do you have any guidance to local electeds on how to best navigate and negotiate a proper parking ratio for a new development? Well, I'm gonna note that this may not be practical in every community or every city, but I would advocate for creating really clear rules that just eliminate the amount of negotiation on a case-by-case -case basis so that you're increasing the degree of predictability uh, in your in your community. And I think what we had found previously when our development review process was probably a, a bit more political than it was now, is that those elected officials who were quite pro housing, they would uh, they would uh, allow housing construction in their community, and they would take a political hit for that, right? So they kind of uh, some some uh, really pro housing council members um, were big advocates for eliminating the amount of political influence and negotiation in the development review process because they found that it was difficult to be a pro-housing uh, elected official and uh, and keep your election certificate. <laughs> I think another important aspect of this discussion is that off-street parking is just one aspect of your whole parking supply. So you have your on-street parking as well. And I think a lot of the problems that we see with people demanding more parking is because we're not managing the on-street supply properly. So we're not charging the right price that will keep some availability in your on-street parking there so that people, when they arrive at their destination, they can easily find a space. What, what's happening is it's free or underpriced. So they get there, there's no parking and they're throwing their hands up and saying like, we need more parking. And we have to address all the different aspects of how parking works in our city. This is Last question I saw, um, are any Chicagoland communities served by Metra managing their public parking spaces to serve commuter parking needs, commercial parking needs, and night nearby resident parking needs, perhaps through both daytime and overnight permit categories? Um, yeah, I think, I feel, oh, go ahead, Liz. I'm sorry, but you can add more to this, but 
when I was looking into this issue, it really depended on who owned the parking lot. A lot of times, I believe that there would be a requirement by Metro to have a certain number of spaces. So if they wanted to develop the lot by their station, they would need to replace those spaces to be available for public use. And the communities that were able to do more of that management of their own parking were the ones that had built their own parking lots. And um, one community that I'm familiar with was the village of Hinsdale, where I did a parking study and they switched to the daily fee option because they said they make so much more money um, with daily fee than they would with a permit or monthly and they're always full um, and they said they'd never go back to anything else but when on the weekends when there's less demand or in the evenings there isn't that commuter parking they use that lot for the restaurants and other people coming to their town. That is just one example. Yeah, yeah I, think, I, I think that's a good, oh, go ahead, Liz. Yeah, I was just gonna say the city of Evanston with most of our municipal parking garages does allow for long-term leasing of development for development. Uh, we also allow for leasing of spaces for residents in the neighborhood. One thing to note, though, with our transit-oriented development projects, um, I think Lindsay might have mentioned earlier that some municipalities have enacted where residents in those buildings cannot get like on-street parking permits. The same um, kind of practice occurs in our public garages as well. So um, that is potentially one opportunity to explore in the future of being able to have long-term leases um, for residential um, developments that are taking advantage of the TOD reductions in parking. Yeah, I think those are good emblematic examples of kind of how that plays out um, throughout the region. I'm wondering, is like a very general question kind of like leaning us towards a conclusion, um, given that all the panelists have in some capacity worked on these types of issues, what advice would you give to um, either municipal staff or planners or people who are interested in advocacy? What advice would you give them about how to, yeah, maybe take the first steps on working on these types of things and trying to enact these similar types of parking reductions um, in their own communities. I nominate Jason to go first. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, my advice is to not put all your eggs in one basket. And when you're engaging in parking reform, note the wide range of benefits, the environmental benefits, the housing cost benefits, uh, the, the transportation benefits, the urban design benefits. Some of those are going to resonate with some people more than others in, in different locations at different times. So um, throw it all at the wall and <laughs> and uh, and hopefully you, you get a receptive audience um, who, who cares about some of those issues and sees the connection and sees the benefit. Uh, I'll go next. Um, so <laughs> ditto what Jason said. Uh, I think we benefit in Chicago from having a number of things that we were looking to advance in, in, in the most recent legislation also helped that there was a precedent for um, these kinds of incentives in TOD zones already. Um, the other thing I'll say, since I'm um, currently, you know, since I'm coming from a coalition based, uh, it's a coalition organization, is to find your allies and find your, find your partners and champions and um, start wherever you can. And if in the end, that means that you take an incremental step that then in two years, three years can be expanded, that is, that's still better than the status quo. Excellent. Um, I was thinking of to add on to what has already been said, the working to identify what your community's values and priorities are first, and then you can very easily show how having more parking is not going to support those values and your visioning and like which images do you think better reflect our community which would you rather have here and asking people about their preferences and then working to show how you can get there
Yeah, I, I don't really have much more to add. I think don't underestimate the amount of time and energy that needs to go into education and conversations on this topic. Um, they have to start early. They have to continue frequently and often throughout the process. And I think that um, incrementally moving towards the goal is likely going to be met with probably more reception than trying to move mountains. Um, although I think being bold and willing to act is an important first step for communities. And um, it's it's necessary. It's it's one of the, the trade-offs that we have to make in order to balance all of the challenges that we have to grapple with um, as local government officials. Um, so good luck. Don't stop trying. And can I put a final plug in for the Parking Reform Network? Because it's yeah. a really great resource for getting information, sharing ideas, and connecting with other people that are trying to implement these changes. Yeah, thanks everybody. Um, I think if doesn't seem like there are any other questions coming in right now. Um, so I wanted to yeah conclude by saying thank you to the panelists um, for your time and your participation, also to all the participants um, for your questions and your engagement. Um, I thought it was a really intriguing discussion. Hopefully, yeah, will allow you to make similar changes in your community. Um, we have these um, webinars that are going throughout the month. Um, next week is same time, uh, different Zoom room, so not exactly same place, uh, but the focus of that webinar is on bus rapid transit and transit friendly streets. Um, so yeah, we'd love to see you in that one if you're able. Um, thanks again for your time today. And yeah, you'll be able to watch a recording of this on YouTube if you'd like.